Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of Unfiltered. I am your host, Josh Cohen. This episode was extremely interesting. I can't wait to, to share the interview with you. I spoke with H.G. Tudor. H.G. Tudor is an author and a leading authority on the topic of narcissism. He himself is a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath, which we get into. He writes from his unique perspective and delivers extensive knowledge on every aspect of dealing with a narcissist. Through his insightful lens, you will learn the true mindset, behaviors, and aims of the narcissist. Myths and false hopes will be extinguished and replaced with pure logic defenses. You will learn your role in each type of relationship with a narcissist and find detailed information on how you can best prepare to deal with and escape from narcissistic abuse. For more information, visit H.G. Tudor's popular blog, Knowing the Narcissist, at narcsite.com. H.G. Tudor regularly engages with his audience to provide direct access to the world's best resource on narcissism and delivers his insights with his engaging, direct, and entertaining style. Be sure to visit the Knowledge Vault on narcsite.com to access an expansive array of assistance programs and logic bulletins that cover a multitude of additional subjects. It was such a pleasure speaking with him. Um, I won't lie, it was a little bit unnerving. One doesn't typically run towards conversations with self-affirmed psychopaths, but this was very interesting, and uh, my curiosity got the better of me, and I do have to say, it was a pleasure speaking with him. And now I give you H.G. Tudor. Okay, I'm here with H.G. Tudor. H.G., thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me on, Josh. Yeah, it's a it's a pleasure. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. Um, I want to discuss, you know, you narcissism uh your particular claim to expertise on the matter before we do hg please tell our listeners briefly who you are and what you do uh, my name is hg tudor which is a pseudonym because i keep my actual identity hidden so as to not cause a problem for me in what i do privately and professionally people know me as a consequence of the work that I do around narcissism and psychopathy, because I'm a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath, meaning I have both narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. And over a number of years, I have shared my perspectives of the world, the way that I function and operate, and the way that my kind, those similar to me, i.e. other narcissists but of different types, psychopaths, etc., function and behave, so that people understand and find out plenty of information about this world, accurate information for once, rather than uh, myths and mistakes about my kind, and also to receive information that gives them solutions to what they're dealing with. And I have a prodigious work ethic with a mountain of material that has been produced across various platforms such as books on Amazon, videos on YouTube, blog articles on my blog, narcosite.com, which are posted also to Twitter and Facebook, over 200 items in the Knowledge Vault. So there's a wealth of material for people to access, and uh, I'm an expert in my field. Excellent. Thank you, HG. Yeah, and we'll, we'll undoubtedly track through a, a great deal of that as we move along. Um, now, I know, you know, for obvious reasons, which you already alluded to, you insist on anonymity. You use the pseudonym that you mentioned. Uh, our listeners should know that I can't see you now, as I expected. I'm, uh, I'm addressing a black box, <laughs> though I hear your, you know, left <laughs> Lewis, uh, tones, uh, reaching back at me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so with all deference to, you know, uh, anonymity and respecting your privacy, I I'm, terribly fascinated by your your background um i'd love to know how it was you came to be diagnosed as a narcissist did it was it a situation where your parents took you to get tested no as i've explained elsewhere as a consequence of my uh behavior a former girlfriend of mine who's a psychology graduate one day explained to me that she believed that i was both narcissist and psychopath and i explained to her that's very interesting why do you say that and i've always known that i've been different mm. and i've always known that i get off on playing with people and i know that i savor the reaction of individuals and i know that i don't function in a similar way to other people for instance i would see the way that my brother and sister would behave and i was different to them 
And I listened to what this lady had to say, and many of the things that she spoke about resonated. I knew better than to go, oh, yes, you're absolutely right, well done. That would transfer power to her. And so I said, well, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing me with the slops of your delinquent mind. I now must be about other matters, and away I went. And I went and did some more reading, and it gave me some labels for me. And then, as I became older, as a part of my uh, agreement to deal with individuals who I call the good doctors, uh, which served my purposes to uh, be involved with them, I received the diagnosis formally from them. So I've always known I've been different. The first confirmation, if you will, albeit informal, came from a former girlfriend who had some expertise in the area. And then in later life, I have received a formal diagnosis from the good doctors. Hmm. Extraordinary. I uh, no, thank you, HG. Well, the the mm-hmm. the thing I'm looking to sort of, I suppose, zero in on because I'm I'm fascinated by it. And I, I dare say a number of our listeners will be as well. Um is you're a bit of a unicorn, aren't you, as a self-aware narcissist, right? So I I suppose the way I want to phrase it, and feel free to add on uh, any way you like, is what do you think was different perhaps in your mental makeup that you accepted the diagnosis? Granted, it took some time, right? But here you are saying that you were diagnosed. Mm -hmm. I am not the only self-aware narcissist or self-aware psychopath that exists. There are others. And um, they are dotted around through different uh, fields in the world. So I'm not the only one. I'm the only one that conveys the insight in the way that I do. How did I become this way? It's a consequence of uh, the way that I evolved, an amalgam of my level of intelligence and just essentially the way that my psychopathy and narcissism evolved was to allow me insight uh, in a way that I was able to cope with understanding with what I am. So it's not the case that I sat down and suddenly went, and lo, I I determined on the third day that I was a narcissist (laughs) and a psychopath. Mm. So I wasn't sort of given a road to Damascus moment of enlightenment or insight, but as I uh, mentioned in my earlier answer, George, I explained, saw that, yeah, I know that I'm different. I know that I get off from playing with people. I know that, for instance, uh, I enjoyed the use of fire uh, and what it uh, achieved. I like to see people react to me. I found that I wasn't bothered by um, people's responses. I was more interested rather than feeling anything for them. I noticed that I didn't feel in relation to people. So uh, an incident where I uh, was defeated in a race, albeit unfairly, so I pushed the boy that uh, beat me into the nettles again and again, thus upsetting him. All I wanted to do was hurt him, and I I recognised that such behaviour would be deemed to be wrong, but I wanted to gain that satisfaction of hurting him, and so I did. And in other instances, when I would see people who were hurt, I learned and understood that they were in pain, and that meant that they wanted some assistance but I didn't feel anything. It was an intellectualizing of their situation, which is the case with many, many things that I witness. Well, I don't actually feel anything. So I can see an old, old lady fall over in the street. I don't feel anything. But I understand and recognize that the appropriate behavior that society deems is to go and offer some help. And if I deem that useful to me, I will do. If I don't, I'll just walk past her and leave her there in the dirt. Yes, for instance, if you see the old lady fall and there's a, a crowd gathered around that might be able to yeah. see you and you'll get a, a wellspring of praise as a result, that's that's quite a good bit of fuel, isn't it? That's right. Mm, indeed. Uh, I know you've said this elsewhere, HD, but I'd love for you to tell our, our listeners, are narcissists made or born? Um, they are a combination of the two. So you have to have the, the genetic predisposition, so you have to have the ingredients fundamentally part of what you are, and then that has to be combined with an environmental impact, which is known as a lack of control environment. So if you liken it to the the baking of a cake, Josh, and you have the ingredients with the genetic predisposition, and then you have the oven at the appropriate temperature and the appropriate duration for those ingredients to go in. No ingredients, but you've got the oven and the temperature. No narcissist. Got the ingredients, but no oven, no narcissist. You've got the ingredients, but the 
ingredients keep getting taken in and out of the oven, or the temperature keeps going up and down, no narcissist. So you need to have that genetic predisposition and those ingredients to be cooked, if you will, uh, for an appropriate duration, which then creates a narcissist. Now, many narcissists have created a sort of slow burn effect, years of being subjected to the lack of control environment, but there are instances where one can always be sort of uh, flash cooked, where there is something that happens that's so traumatic, traumatic that it forges in an instance the narcissism. So this is where, for instance, you might get a child whose parents are kind and empathic, but further back in the lineage, there is a, a narcissist. So that genetic predisposition has been carried down a generation or two or three. <laughs> Excuse me. And so far, there's never been a lack of control environment. And this child has the genetic predisposition, but it's sat dormant. Mum and dad look after the child. They don't abuse the child. They bring the child up well. And then one day, the child witnesses a home invasion where Ma and Pa are murdered. Or there's a road accident where Ma and Pa are killed. Or the child is abused outside of the home by a football coach. Those incidents can create a narcissist and may well do so instantaneously uh, as a consequence of the exposure to a particularly traumatic event. But, as always, you have to have that genetic predisposition and you must also have that lack of control environment. Hmm. Understood. That makes sense to me. I, uh, you know, that I, I think, and I suspect you will agree with this, uh, that the word narcissist is a word that I think is both often over and misused, right? Mm -hmm. Much like the word racist or fascist, we could play this game all day long. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so perhaps I'll just ask you clearly, uh, what is a narcissist and how can it be differentiated from someone who isn't a narcissist, but nonetheless might get the title from, say, an unkind ex, for instance, right? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> a narcissist isn't somebody who you don't like because they've been unpleasant towards you. But many people bandy the term around that basically where someone hasn't treated them particularly well or done something they didn't like, they immediately say, oh, you're a narcissist. And first of all, what you have to do is you have to look at the evidence and there has to be credible evidence of certain types of behavior which have arisen over a sustained period of time. So you might have somebody who find out that he's cheated on his wife. And you might say, well, what an utter narcissist. Well, you can't because he's only done it once. And there might be, re there might be legitimate reasons behind that that caused uh, him to act in that way. So just off that one act of infidelity, you can certainly condemn him and say, oh, he's an asshole, he's a poor husband, or whatever you'd like to describe him as. But what you can't say is that he's a narcissist. And instead, what you have to look for is that the individual uh, acts with a sense of entitlement and that there's a certain uh, threshold, a level of entitlement that they show. Mm -hmm. So is this individual particularly self-absorbed? Do they order people around a lot? Do they go where they're not welcome? Do they steal money? Do they claim other people's credit? Do they expect an immediate response to everything that they do? Are they a freeloader? Do they allow other people to pay? So you're looking at racking up all of those behaviours to get to a certain level of sense of entitlement. You need to examine, is there a lack of accountability? So is this person someone who has no genuine friends? Do they routinely break rules? Do they have no regard for following the law? Do they engage in criminal activity? Do they fail to provide emotional support to the person that they're in a relationship with or their children, for example? Are they habitually unpunctual? Are they somebody that never apologizes? Mm -hmm. Are they somebody that engages in the parental abrogation of their responsibilities and duties? Again, racking all part of those things. And similarly, we look at do they exhibit grandiosity, magical thinking? Do they exhibit haughty behaviours? Uh, what do we see in terms of manipulative behaviour? What's their boundary recognition like? What aspects of the narcissistic dynamic do we see? Do we see black and white thinking? Do they have seamless intimate partner primary sources? Do they use a bolt hole? Do they micromanage? Are they competitive? Or do they engage in one-upmanship? Do we see that they suffer from paranoia? Are they routinely a hypocrite? And then do we, we look at the examination of emotional empathy? So we have all of these categories with various indicators in each one. 
And having assessed all of that, there is a particular threshold, a uh, standard that I apply to determine. So essentially, you're looking for those behaviours to be repeated by that individual and that they score across all of those areas. And so they they are preoccupied with success. They have a grandiose version of themselves. They need the responses of other people. They're defined by the responses of other people. And so put all of that together and I make a determination in terms of is that person a narcissist or, or not. Now, there are many people that can engage in many of the things that I've just described here and there. That doesn't make them narcissists. You can have somebody who is a very kind person who could turn around and do something quite awful because they deem it justified on that one instance as a consequence of the way that person has behaved. Or it might be that they've suffered an erosion of their emotional empathy. So, for instance, ordinarily somebody is very even-tempered and kind, but he's absolutely exhausted from working long hours, and he comes home and his wife asks him a question, he snaps at her, mm -hmm. and he's quite unpleasant, and she bursts into tears. He, he apologizes and says, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm really tired, I've been working on this project. And uh, he doesn't do it again, or it's months, years before he, he does it. That's not somebody who's showing those habitual behaviours that would then be determined to be a narcissist. What tends to happen is that um, there are people who throw the term around basically when their relationship goes wrong um, or that there's somebody that has perhaps acted in an entitled fashion. They go, oh, he's such a narcissist, mm -hmm. but it, you don't know enough about them. So... I often give the example of you walk into a convenience store and there's a lady in there. She's shouting and screaming. She's throwing tins of beans around and she's vaulting onto the counter trying to steal money out of the till. And she's uh, calling the shopkeeper horrible names. What are we dealing with? Well, on the one hand, this might be a narcissist. She's showing a sense of entitlement in the way that she's behaving. She's showing poor boundary recognition by trying to steal. She's showing an absence of emotional empathy for the shopkeeper in, in um verbally abusing him and stealing his money. She's showing destruction of property, which shows a sense of entitlement and lack of accountability for behavior. So we're getting quite a few narcissistic indicators here. Indeed. So she might be a narcissist. Or might it be that this lady actually is at the end of the tether because her husband's at home, being made redundant and unable to find work because he's got a back problem. She has just been told that she's going to be laid off. She's got three children and her bank card has been declined and it's pushed her over the edge. So circumstance has caused her to act out in a way which is similar to a narcissist. So that's why we would need more information. And too often, mm. people make a judgment immediately on one instance or a couple of instances over a short period of time and go, oh, that person's a narcissist. And you just can't do that. Right. No, agreed. I, I understand that. I, uh, I'd like to linger for a little bit uh, HG on the idea of empathy. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. it. Yeah, you mentioned it twice there already. Um, you mentioned specifically emotional empathy. So, mm. <laughs> excuse me, to pick you back up on the uh, the the guy who comes home, you know, tired and late from work, uh, yelling yeah. at his wife. Well, the intellectual empathy uh, side of a narcissist, I would imagine, could be could be something like, well, I know I want to apologize because apologizing is the quickest way of getting the crying to stop, and I find the crying annoying. Right. Versus, mm -hmm. say, emotional empathy, which is I genuinely feel bad, feel guilty mm -hmm. and feel maybe a bit of shame for uh, yeah. making making my loved one feel this way. And now I want to apologize on the back of that. So could you talk a little bit about um, the different uh, let's call it shades of empathy <laughs> to coin a phrase? Mm. Certainly. Well, with emotional empathy, um, it's like an invisible force that guides somebody's somebody's behavior. And that emotional empathy contains empathic traits such as honesty, moral compass, caring, being a truth seeker, having a desire to heal and fix. And it guides that person almost in an invisible way so that they don't actually think about what they're doing. They just do. So some people, they, they will never walk into somebody's house uninvited. They'll always knock on the door. So they're respecting a boundary. They don't walk up to the door and go, ooh, I'd better knock and show good boundary recognition. They just do it without thinking. Hmm. 
And that's because they're governed by their emotional empathy. They see somebody fall, they rush over to help. They don't think, oh, I better go and help. They just do. They find a wallet in the street. Their first instinct is to hand it in. So there's that sort of like invisible, almost instinctive emotional empathy. There's also the emotional empathy of, if I lost my wallet, I'd like somebody to hand it in for me, so I'm going to do the right thing. So there's that ability to recognize the situation and put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. And that's a sort of safeguarding emotional empathy mm. where the individual thinks about it, but it's still driven from a place of feeling. So you have those strands of emotional empathy. And then you have with certain people that their emotional empathy is almost like a form of energy tie to other people that they feel burdened by the emotional responses of other individuals, uh, that they take it on and feel overwhelmed by it at times. And therefore they have to retreat from people so that they'd have to go off into a space and almost cleanse themselves of the energy of other people. They, it's a very visceral response to the emotions of other people. So you have those differing strands, but all of that is emotional empathy. Mm. Then you have what I have, which is cognitive empathy or intellectual empathy, as you called it, Josh. And in essence, it's fake empathy. I don't have any emotional empathy because I don't feel anything, but I've learned that in order to get to what I need, there are instances where I need to fit in and there are instances where it is very advantageous for me to give the pretense of caring for the purposes of manipulating people. So I know, for instance, that if somebody's crying, that invariably means that they're hurt or in pain. Mm -hmm. I've also learned to recognize that tears can also mean that someone's overjoyed. And at first, when I saw somebody crying, I asked my sister, why is water leaking from her face? Because I didn't recognize what it meant. And she looked at me as if I was an alien and said, what are you talking about, HG? And I said, her, what, why, why is there water leaking? She laughed, she was tears. And I was, what does that mean? She explained. And then that registers with me. So I've learned to recognize downturned mouth, reddened face, tears streaming, strange wah noise being made. Right, that person's upset or injured or hurt. That means that they would perhaps require some kind of remedial action by way of comfort or reassurance. That does not come naturally to me. I have to intellectualize it. I have to think it through. But I do so very quickly because I have, through many, many years, I recognize what that means. You will instinctively recognize that that person is in distress and offer help without thinking about it. I will do that almost as quickly as you, mm. but because I've learned to understand what that means, and I still go through that process. So I've got faster and faster understanding what those things mean. And then that enables me to be, appear like you or other people who are not of my kind so that I fit in. And it also is advantageous because in certain instances, by appearing to be compassionate, it enables me to control people. It enables me to draw fuel from them. So certain narcissists don't have cognitive empathy. They, You literally get a blank look. They don't understand what's going on. And they'll just sort of shrug it off. They'll so The person will look at them and go, aren't you going to do something? And they go, why? Or they'll go, what, what, what are you crying for? when their dog has been run over, they, they, they can't link the act to the response from the person. But there are other narcissists that have uh, learned through cognitive empathy to fit in, but it is just a veneer, it is just a facade that's put in place. And with some narcissists that operate that way, you are sometimes able to find that it's a veneer or facade because there's a bit of a delay before you get the right response or you sometimes get an incongruous response to the situation and most people don't really recognize what that means but with some people when they've had exposure to narcissists they go ah yes there's basically that yeah. gap between what you should do and what you are doing and the what you should do took time to catch up or sometimes it glitches and you get what I call the 404 response where it doesn't compute. 
<laughs> That's good. And I like that. Uh, yeah. Well, and also, you know, people are quite forgiving and quite understanding. If, you know, you, you, uh, someone's mother dies and they go to tell it to their friend who's a narcissist, uh, you know, uh, and they, they recount that or think about it later. You know, I, I, I told this so and so this, uh, horrible, you know, thing that happened and he, sort of laughed it off or I sort of got the, yeah. as you put it, the blank, the blank look. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I suspect that is typically fairly quickly forgiven as, Oh, that's just his humor or that's just the way he is. So on and so forth. Anything but condemning the person on the charge of narcissism. That's correct. There are people invariably don't immediately go to, Oh yes, that's a narcissist at work, but they, invariably go to a different and incorrect explanation for that behavior. Um, so, and it isn't helped, of course, by supposed relationship advisor experts and so forth who are actually dealing with narcissism but fail to spot it and they'll say, oh, he's just got anger management issues or she's high maintenance and such like, and they call it by something else. And so you get all, many of these instances of people using the wrong terminology for what actually is the narcissistic dynamic and it makes it more difficult because people don't call it for what it is and i see this almost on a daily basis i'm perusing the news i can see that they're talking about a narcissist but they don't say as such uh, i know sometimes there are instances where they're a little guarded about doing so because there might be repercussions and defamation and so on and so forth um but ultimately too often, people just don't recognize what it is. And they essentially give people the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. They they can't... Many human beings have a difficulty, Josh, in accepting that someone can be so wholly removed from what they are that they have difficulty accepting that there are those of us who have no sense of remorse, have no conscience, that we simply do not care. We just issue a pretense of caring and some of our kind don't even do that yeah and it's i think i i can see that that's abhorrent and frightening for people to comprehend that there are homo sapiens walking the earth that are like that they don't want to contemplate it uh, but it is a fact that that is the way that we function and that many of our kind of course get ourselves into those positions of power which cause problems for other people because we are those soulless remorseless guilt-free conscience-free individuals that are only out for ourselves well yeah i i agree hg and that's actually a, a great springboard to my next question um it's something that i definitely want to make sure you know lands for our listeners <clears throat> excuse me which we've already you know talked uh in some depth about a narcissist obviously is something more or darker than someone who's selfish only thinks of themselves uh -huh. etc uh i know you told andrew gold uh, a few months back that a narcissist is someone who sees the world in a different way indeed you've already uh -huh. e even just in the course of this interview you've used the the word the phrase my kind i believe three times already um uh -huh. would it be fair to say that narcissists don't form real relationships but that they form transactions or a series of transactions in the form of people Yes, people are appliances to us. As I've often explained, your toasters, your washing machines, your TV sets, or your, your can of beans that we come along and we use. We have no regard for the impact on you, save to the extent that we have to because it benefits us. So, for example... A narcissist may provide help to somebody because it's advantageous for the narcissist to do so. It's not done out of any sense of true obligation or, or altruism. So a narcissist that's a parent may well believe they love their children, but they don't. They look after them because it makes them look good. It's mm. part of their facade. So it is transactional because at the heart of everything that we do, at the heart of everything that a narcissist does is the pursuit of the prime aims. People must be controlled. We must draw fuel from them and obtain character traits and residual benefits from them. And that governs every interaction. It's governing my interaction with you now. I'm not talking to you because I'm being a jolly decent chap giving you my time. I'm doing it because I recognize that it was advantageous to me because it would extend my legacy. I'll be able to use this video 
And then furthermore, in the course of this conversation, I have to control you. And one way I do that is by answering your questions courteously, politely, and in, in an interesting way, that I don't suddenly wander off and start playing around with something in my study and ignoring what you're saying so that you then think, gosh, H.G. Tudor's a bit of a douche canoe, isn't he? Because then I'd lose control of you. Mm. But there'd be certain narcissists that would behave that way because their evolved skills aren't as great as mine. But the fact is I'm not being polite to you because I'm inherently polite. I'm being polite to you because it serves my purposes. And the difference is because I operate through the pseudonym, I can be upfront about this. And that's the great joy that people have with regard to my information is I can tell you exactly how it is. And I tell you what I am from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But it's quite entertaining because notwithstanding the fact that I say to people, I am a narcissistic psychopath. I am not a pleasant person. I am very charming, urbane, magnetic, great fun to be around. But I also hurt people mm -hmm. and hurt them very severely. And I make it very clear about this. And yet there are still those who almost refuse to accept that that's the case. So it just shows how powerful the inability to accept this can be, going back to what you were talking about earlier, Josh, that I can, in plain sight, say to somebody, I am a narcissistic mm -hmm. psychopath. And you don't, I, I have people say, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be with you, HG. And I say, are you? I very much teach you you shouldn't do that. Right. But they do because they can't help but be drawn to me because of what I am. And there's still a refusal by some to truly accept what I am. There are others, let's be fair and let's be balanced, there are others who say, I'd never want to meet you. I'd be terrified of you. That's sensible. There are others that would say, I admire your work, but I think you're an absolute disgusting human being. You're allowed to say that because you're allowed to have that opinion. Uh because some of the things that I do, people would deem them to be disgusting. I deem them appropriate and necessary. But with everything in life, it's about perspectives. Right. And uh, if you caught me smirking once or twice as you were talking there, HG, uh, one of the things I was kind of thinking about, you know, even in just making the mental decision to reach out to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it th th There is a bit of humor to be found, and perhaps there's something instructive in it as well. Um Hey, I've heard about this guy, H.G. Tudor. He's a self-proclaimed narcissist and, and psychopath and laughing at the fact that my impulse was, I better reach out to him because I definitely want to talk to him, <laughs> you know? Well, that is that is understandable because you're not going to be hurt by this conversation. And it's an interesting topic and I'm an interesting man. And we both win. Yeah. I extend my legacy. New people get to hear about my work. You have an interesting conversation with me and, um, I scratch that itch that you have with regard to your questions. Mm -hmm. So the transaction between us can be mutually beneficial. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I would feel as you do. I um we haven't talked about it just yet that we we broached the topic and I think it's it's high time I ask you, uh, HD. Um, please describe the fuel matrix to me. The fuel matrix comprises of appliances, people that range from tertiary individuals, so strangers and acquaintances. Secondary sources, friends, family, colleagues, which can include intimate individuals, ditto with tertiary, and then the primary source, who is the most important individual, usually intimate in nature, so spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, cohab, sometimes non-intimate in nature, a friend or family member. The narcissist fuel matrix is hugely important because those individuals contribute to the prime aims. All those individuals in that fuel matrix must be controlled in some shape or form, the narcissist will draw fuel from them, either near constantly with certain individuals, repeatedly with others, intermittently with others, and infrequently with others. Some of those people will provide character traits, not all. Some will provide residual benefits, not all. You're in my fuel matrix. You're a tertiary source because we don't really know one another. But if you and I spoke several times, you become secondary source because I get to know you better. But at this moment, you are a non-intimate tertiary source in my fuel matrix. That means when you come up on my radar, I have to control you. Mm -hmm. It means I will draw fuel from you, but not always. It means that I might take some character traits from you. So it might be that there'd be something that you would tell me in the course of this interview that I could go and use elsewhere. And there's the residual benefit, which is this gives me a platform to reach other people and it allows me to extend my legacy. 
So you serve a purpose to me in my fuel matrix. Now, people that I would label as friends, I see them more often. I have a different form of control over them. I the, the fuel that comes from them is more potent compared to you. I may draw on that fuel more often by virtue of them being a secondary source. Mm. I'm more likely to gain character traits from them, and they're probably going to provide me with more residual benefits than, say, compared to you, because they'll form part of the facade. It might be that I rely on one of those individuals to provide me with information about somebody, or I might ask one of them to give me a lift into town because I want to have a drink. So there's different ways there. It might be that I uh, have... Um, I'm having an affair with somebody. So that woman would be an intimate partner secondary source. Again, she's in the fuel matrix and has to be controlled. So I write about all of this in my book, Fuel, but the fuel matrix is essentially the body of individuals that cater to the provision of the prime aims and is structured into a, into a hierarchy based upon their importance to the narcissist. And that hierarchy alters. Some people... Uh, they come into the fuel matrix, they're used heavily, and then they're put to one side, and they might never be used again. Other people are picked up and put down, picked up and put down, varying degrees. So it's a fluid beast. Hmm. Hmm. Extraordinary. I, uh, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are two narcissists I'm thinking of in my brain right now, and um, let me see. Uh, I think I... I think I'll I'll show the courtesy that you've shown and just insist on anonymity <laughs> with regards to them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but in both instances, the narcissists who don't know each other um, have what I would call an unhealthy relationship with things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, very materialistic. And indeed, I, I have you quoted uh, as saying that both narcissists and psychopaths see people as objects. Mm -hmm. And yes, sir. And I'm curious, in the course of your... Um, uh, study or in, in the course of your touching this topic, have you noticed any correlation between narcissism and an over focus or obsession on things? Well, <clears throat> the beauty of things are that they do what we want nearly most of the time. So I go to my television set and I switch it on and lo and behold, it comes on. It doesn't, it doesn't say to me, Please talk to me. Please listen to me while I tell you about my shitty day at work. It allows me to immediately watch the series that I want to watch. Mm. So it's compliant. It gives me what I need. So it's advantageous in that respect. Furthermore, uh, let's say there is uh, an object that uh, is a bust or a Roman emperor. And it looks rather good. One can admire it and utilize that to triangulate with other people. Do you like my bust of this Roman emperor? Oh, yeah, it's rather superb. Thank you very much. You've just demonstrated it under control. And give me some fuel. But the bust doesn't cause me a problem. The bust doesn't make any demand on me. It's not asking me to do things for it. So we want people to be like those objects, that they always cater to our needs, that you don't threaten our sense of control. Inanimate objects don't they invariably do what we want. Sure, your car might break down or sometimes your TV set might not come on, in which case then we're not very pleased with that inanimate object and we swap it out for another one. And that's what we do with people. When they're broken, when they're a broken appliance, they get traded in for somebody else in the same way that you would do so if your computer stops working, you go and buy a different one. You might take it to be repaired, I suppose, but that takes time and it's easier to go and get a new one. And we do that with people rather than solve the problem that is in the relationship, it's far easier just to kick you to one side and go and get another version of you. So we have a preoccupation with objects because objects do what we want and they don't threaten our control because as narcissists, we're hypersensitive to issues of the threat to control. So objects enable us to get around many of those instances. Hmm. That's fascinating. I, uh, a bunch of stuff started making sense to me. <laughs> so, Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So that, that's appreciated. I, um, uh, perhaps I should have asked this earlier. I'll, I'll, I'll correct the mistake now. Um, could you describe to our audience, uh, HD, what is a greater elite narcissist? Well, I categorize narcissists, Josh, between different schools and cadres. So cadres are in, in essence preferences. 
that are somatic, which is basically narcissists that are preoccupied with the way that things look. So they want a hard body for a girlfriend. They want the big house. They want the flash car. They want lots of money. Then there's cerebral, which is matters of the mind, the arts, philosophy, being interested in reading and music and such like. Victim is basically a narcissist that uh, is often complaining, um, has problems with their health, has problems with injury, might be impotent, wants incessants to be mothered. And then the elite is the amalgam of the somatic and the cerebral. So they have a bit of those two sides. So that's the cadre, which essentially demonstrates what the narcissist has with regards to preferences in people that they surround themselves with. Then we have the school, which tells you how that narcissist functions and operates. So there's lesser, broken down into lower, lesser, middle, lesser, upper, lesser, A, upper, lesser, B. Mid-range, broken down into lower, mid-range, middle, middle, range, A, middle, middle, range, B, and upper, mid-range. And then there's greater, which is divided into lower, greater, middle, greater, and upper, greater. And all of those subschools have some similarity. They have similarities and considerable differences. With a greater narcissist, so greater would cover lower, greater, middle, greater, or upper, greater, that narcissist is aware of what they are, they're Machiavellian, they are uh, invariably of high intelligence, but not necessarily the highest intelligence. They exhibit very high levels of charm, they're invariably successful, they invariably um, operate with a facade of superiority, mm. that they can get away with things basically because they're seen as uh so let's take for example a little old lady falls down in the street and barack obama's going by and he doesn't help out and people will go well you know at the time he's president you know he can't be expected to do those things so he's given a pass based upon his superiority mm-hmm. or that the narcissist may turn around and say i can't help you know i've got a i've got a nation to save or a nation to invade or whatever so people go, yeah i understand that so they, they leave to one side but the greater knows what they are, and the, the greater plans, the greater thinks ahead, uh, although naturally operates in the moment like any narcissist does, but also has regard to the collateral consequences of those actions. So those are some of the aspects that are associated with the greater elite. Uh, there's a lot more besides it, but uh, I don't want to go on and on. <laughs> uh, no, I I appreciate it, HG. Thank you. I uh, one thing I was kind of thinking as as you were talking, this might be an odd question, so perhaps you can help me flesh it out a little bit. Um, the employing one's uh, voice in building relationships or or, or seizing fuel. Um, I have noticed, and I, I suspect you've been told this before, that you have a a great voice for for talking. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. My voice isn't horrible. Either, as you've probably noticed, and I, the voice for radio and the face to match, right? Um, <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm just curious if, as you're, um, when you're in the process of gathering fuel, are you overly um, concerned with uh, your voice and what you're projecting out, or is this a completely dud question? No, not at all. My voice is hugely important to me, particularly so through this medium where I don't show myself. Mm. I'm well-spoken individual with uh, an extensive vocabulary and articulate myself way well and do so in a manner which enables people to understand. And the stentorian, chocolatey, velvety voice that one's glorious narrator, uh, I refer to has, is a weapon. And I utilize this. So I have a conversational tone, which you're experiencing now, I have a broadcast tone, which is what I use when I'm narrating for my videos. But of course, when I'm dealing with certain people, I will change this voice. So I will alter the accent. I deliberately pronounce words in a peculiar way with some of my videos to mask identification of who I might be. Because regularly people say, you have such a distinctive and... uh, impressive voice are you not concerned that somebody would recognize it and the short answer is no i'm not two reasons one i do change it very slightly and also with the pronunciation of certain words but also if someone were to come across it they would have this moment of that can't be 
So let's say I'm called John Smith. I'm not. But they go, that can't be John Smith doing those videos. Why would he be doing that? So it just wouldn't connect. So I'm entirely confident that there wouldn't be any recognition. And it's interesting because I've repeatedly had people interested in me doing voiceovers, etc. Hasn't really led anywhere because of other commitments. Just something that I might do because it would entertain me thoroughly if somebody's watching television and all of a sudden they go, hang on a second, that's H.G. Tudor inviting me to purchase the new BMW. <laughs> and uh, I would find that uh, ra- I would find that rather entertaining, but it is it is a weapon, and I use it in terms of people are bowled over by it. Mm-hmm. It's reassuring and uh, infuses confidence in people because of the uh, uh, well spoken nature of my voice and the confidence that exudes from it and the baritone that it is. But also, as I say in my day to day interactions with people, I will mirror them. So in some instances, I deem it appropriate to utilize the same accent that they have uh, because then they feel assured. In other instances, I will use a different accent to mask who I am so that they they might turn around and say to somebody, oh, yeah, it was a Geordie I was speaking to. No, it wasn't. But they thought they were. And that's part of the manipulation that takes place. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I, I think I, maybe you're doing it with me now, but I think I detect the, the faintest hints of an English accent as well. Um, so the, a deep voice coupled with a, a beautiful English accent, um, there's not, not much guard against it. <laughs> well, I, I think there's a difficulty really. It's understandable, uh, if you're not from the United Kingdom, but there isn't really, uh, any such thing as an English accent. I think what you're, was, um, because we have, was doing your country. Uh, lots of uh, regional accents that that take place. Um, what I what I have is what's called received pronunciation, which is a bit like a BBC newsreader. But I allow because I spent quite a lot of time in the north of England, so there's a, a touch of northernness in my pronunciation of certain words. Hmm. And uh, I do find it entertaining when people think they know which part of the United Kingdom I'm from. Uh, sometimes I'm slightly offended by some people <laughs> thinking I'm from certain places. I'm thinking, seriously, um, particularly if they're English speakers, uh, they're from the UK themselves, uh, one can understand with people who aren't, particularly where people have English as a second language, they it's hard for them to distinguish. So, so repeatedly I get people going, you're Hugh Grant, aren't you? <laughs> because they, they hear that quite well-spoken voice of his and it because our initials are both HG. They think, oh, Hugh Grant, yeah. whereas anybody who's from the United Kingdom would go, no, he's not. You can tell that they don't sound the same. <laughs> or then again, maybe I am Hugh Grant and I'm just putting a different voice on. <laughs> yeah, branded <laughs> branded by the tongue, I think, is the, the phrase I've heard to describe uh, yes. English. Yes. Uh, um, excellent. Uh, so, yeah, HG, in your book, uh, Fuel, available, by the way, on yes. Amazon, you're welcome. Uh <laughs> You, uh, you, you talk about forms of delivery. Um, and this can include, mm-hmm. uh, I just have a, a very short list, neutral response, admiring gesture, tearful, tearful words, etc. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I'd love for you to please tell our listeners just a little bit more about that. Fuel is the response that somebody gives that's precipitated by something that we've done. So when I give you an answer and you reply to me and say, thank you, HG, you've just given me some fuel by virtue of your words of recognition and the appreciative tone. And because people can see you, your facial expression and look in your eyes provides fuel as well. So there's four strands that have come towards me, if you will. Somebody makes me a cup of tea. That is a kind gesture. That is providing me with fuel. Someone shouts at me, HG, you're an arsehole. That's negative fuel, but it's recognition. And it's challenge fuel because it's challenging the notion that I'm not a very nice person. Now, in some instances, I just laugh that off, which to nullify the threat composed by it. But with fuel, it's broken down into potency, which is linked to the person's position in the fuel matrix, least potent tertiary source, source rather, most potent, former intimate partner, degrees. You then have proximity, which is linked to the method of delivery. 
So somebody sending me a, an email saying, HG, you're absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your work. Provides me with a small amount of fuel because it's just the written word. If I'm having sex with somebody, the fact that I'm proximate to them and all the oohs and the ahs and give it to me, all of that gives me a huge amount of fuel because I'm receiving the words, the tone, the look in the eyes, the body language, the facial expression, etc. So that's a huge amount of fuel because it's proximate with the delivery that's occurring there. And then, of course, you have the frequency as well. So if I'm uh, engaging in um, playing hide the sausage with somebody <laughs> for a few hours, then I get a few hours worth of fuel. Mm-hmm. Whereas if somebody comes, whereas if somebody comes up to me and says you're a dickhead and then walks off, I just got a small burst of fuel from them, albeit challenge fuel of a negative n- nature. And fuel gets broken down into positive and negative. So positive is I love you, HG, or HG, you're brilliant. Negative is you're a douche canoe. I hate you. You also have pure fuel, which is where there's no control. So saying that's pure positive fuel. Or crying because I've upset you is pure negative fuel. Mm. If you rage at me and they, you're an absolute human being and I don't like your hairstyle, you give me challenge fuel of a negative name. So the fuel's fine. Thank you very much. I'll drink all day, but you're insulting me. Or that threatens my sense of control. So I nullify it in some way. That's a brief run through with what regard to what fuel and the book goes into much greater detail of it and uh, it is the narcissist uh, we, we need it I as a narcissistic psychopath don't need as much as a pure narcissist so there are times where I, I can be away from people which suits me because I don't really like people Yes, I find that they, they, they get in the way um, but I, I have to have some involvement with them because I need to draw fuel from them because that provides me with sustenance if if you will. Pure narcissists very much need people uh, almost on a daily basis. Hmm. Fascinating. Uh, thank you, HG. I, uh, you know, another word, uh, much like narcissist and racist and so forth, that I think has become unfairly ubiquitous, in my view, has been mm-hmm. the word gaslighting, right? <laughs> yes, I agree with you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I, I suppose in plain terms and it it lives in very much the same way as the word narcissist oh so and so is gaslighting me it can't just be that they might Uh disagree with you or see it differently right there has to be intention and a weaponization behind it so uh right so i'd love to know hg just in in plain words what does the term gaslighting mean to you gaslighting is altering somebody else's reality so they believe that the reality they perceive is incorrect it isn't just disagreement which you've hinted at there, or, or more than hinted at, where people go, oh, you're gaslighting me because you're saying that you're wrong. No, that's not gaslighting. So it's causing someone to question their reality so that they doubt that what they've said, they actually said. Uh, it isn't just simple disagreement. So, for example, it involves a revision of history so that the narcissist will say, <clears throat> uh, so... The narcissist returns after being out all day, and his wife says, "Did you uh, did you purchase that bottle of dirt champagne?" Now that's a challenge because she's asking him, "Have you done something?" Mm. Let's assume he's an unaware narcissist. So his narcissism says, "Incoming threat to control. We need to nullify it." First line of the twin lines of narcissistic defense: denial. So he goes, "You didn't ask me to get any champagne." Now, he believes what he's saying because his narcissism makes it so. She did actually, uh, first thing in the morning, before he left the house, ask him to get some champagne. He now denies it. She goes, no, I asked you earlier. Threat comes in again because she's questioning him. He rejects it. No, no, you didn't. And if you do this often enough with somebody, they will start to doubt themselves. And that's what the gaslighting is. So the narcissist's repeated denial and insistence that she didn't ask interferes with her perception of reality that causes her to then think, well, perhaps I didn't. Mm -hmm. And the narcissist is so uh, firm in that belief because the narcissism makes it so, whereas non-narcissists see in shades of grey and therefore are more likely to start going, well, yeah, perhaps maybe I didn't ask him. Maybe I did get it wrong. 
And sometimes I'm sure I did ask him, but he seems so adamant that I didn't. Maybe I've got it wrong and he's right. And the confidence with which we say it causes you to think that you're the one that's in the wrong, which is precisely what we want to happen. Mm. Mm. That makes sense to me. But you're, you're right, Josh, that the use of gaslighting has just been banded around willy nilly and it doesn't, and it isn't, it isn't being used correctly by people. Right. And doesn't, you know, isn't worth any good to the people that actually are gaslighting or the people that are the victims of it. Um, mm-hmm. sort of, you sort of get into a, if everybody's gaslighting, nobody is sort of thing. Or if well, a, a gaslighter is simply someone that you call a gaslighter. Maybe that's a better way. Yeah, of this goes it. back to what you're saying. But you, know, you label someone a narcissist because they disagreed with you, or right. they've been unpleasant to you. That's not what a narcissist is. Just you know, just because someone's disagreed with you, that doesn't make them a narcissist. In fact, that might start to raise the question that you might be one because you're so touch, touchy to the fact that somebody's disagreed with you. Hmm. Of course, again, we can't we can't say off that one instance. Uh, it is it is often the case that it's actually the narcissist bandies these terms around incorrectly. Right, but they're doing they're doing so because their sense of control is being threatened, and one way to nullify that threat to control is to provoke somebody with an insult. You're a narcissist. You're gaslighting me. Uh, your flying monkeys are having a go at me. Right. So it's quite common for a narcissist actually to bandy these terms around. Now, if you've been using these terms, don't start immediately thinking, "Oh my God, I'm a narcissist," because as I make it very clear. You can't make a determination just on somebody's use of those words. What I am saying is that it is quite common that certain narcissists use these terms repeatedly and frequently when they're not appropriate. But in their world, they are appropriate because through their distortion field, Mm -hmm. they see that individual as being a problem and thus they deem them to be a narcissist. Right, right. I, uh, keeping an eye on our time here, HD, you want to be mm-hmm. respectful of our, of our hour approaching. Um, certainly. Gosh, I have just a couple questions left. May I go ahead? Of course. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I, uh, no, excuse me. Yeah. One thing that I want to make sure that I pull in here, cause I want to make sure that I understand it if, if for no other reason, um, is the idea of the dark empath, right? Um, we're just we're, we uh we're we're broaching on very broad words a lot in this interview you know much like the word narcissist the word empath is a word that you know everyone thinks that they know what it means and they likely use the word in concept where it doesn't belong right mm-hmm. so i'd love to know what is a dark empath and what flags can we look for to spot one dark empaths a narcissist so these people come along and go, I am the dark empath. I am a good and decent person, but I have this streak in me whereby I kick ass and don't push me, etc. Mm. They're an unaware mid-range narcissist because empathic people, truly empathic people, don't go around shouting about it. Right. They just get on with it. They don't have to go around. I see them the t- turn up on my platforms. I'm a super ninja, Hayoka dark empath. Sure you are. No, you're not. You're actually an unaware, middle, mid-range, type B, mealy-mouthed, shriveled-up, walnut bald, crybaby narcissist. But you don't know it. And so they come up with this idea of, yeah, I'm the dark empath, and I, I eat narcissists for lunch. Yeah, okay. You, you, you insist that. But the dark empath is a creation of unaware narcissists. Simple as that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But one thing I want to ask you about HG, uh, you know, just yesterday, actually, I think you published on your blog, uh, narcsite.com, knowing mm-hmm. the narcissist, how to handle the narcissist in court. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I- I'd love for you to maybe give us a quick list of the particulars, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I'm not going to go into detail about it because I'll now be selling myself short because it's a product that you can buy. So I'm not that stupid. Uh. Um, <laughs> But essentially what it does is it tells you how you should, oddly enough, deal with a narcissist if you have a court situation with them. So how you should go about uh, preparatory work, how you should deal with them at the courthouse itself, what you should expect, things that you ought to do to get a better result, things that you shouldn't do to avoid elementary er errors. And it's a fantastic and inexpensive package which you can obtain from the Knowledge Vault, which you'll find by entering the menu bar at narcsite.com or 
finding the article that you've alluded to there, Josh. And that gives you all of the detail about what you can do. And if you want more help bespoke to your situation, then you can speak to me through an audio consultation and say, look, this is what I'm dealing with, HG. Uh, what do I do? And then I will take you through all the various steps, which includes telling you what you should be doing, and just as importantly, the things that you shouldn't be doing, because often people go on fool's errands, and uh, it saves you a lot of time and heartache and money by following the uh, key advice that I provide to you, so, which is distilled in that package that you've just mentioned. Brilliant. Thank you, HG. I, uh, you know, I, I can already hear the distant echoes of our listeners um, saying something like, well, clearly HG Tudor has empathy and he cares for people. After all, he's out here on this glorious crusade informing people of narcissism and, and narcissists, et cetera, right? Um, so perhaps you and I uh, should dispel that myth now. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't do this out of an innate compassion or kindness, but you do it, as I think you mentioned uh, earlier in our interview, to preserve a legacy, correct? Yes. I, I do it because I find the information that's incorrect about my kind offensive. And that threatens my sense of control, so I want it corrected. I'm irritated by the clowns that think they know about narcissism and psychopathy when they don't. So I want to correct that. I will die at some point. It's a long way off, but I will. And one way of ensuring that I defeat the threat to control that is death is by the creation of a legacy that will live on afterwards. So by ha having millions of people read my work, talk about me, watch my videos, etc., they will continue to do that after I've shuffled off this mortal coil. And therefore, by talking to you, by creating the videos that I do, by creating the excellent material that I do, by helping thousands of people that I do in consultation, it's all self-serving. I control them. I gain fuel from them. I gain residual benefit because I get paid to do this. Mm -hmm. And chief of all, I am creating a legacy whereby millions of people know about me and will continue to know about me once I'm dead, and that's why I do it. Many people would like to think that I've got emotional empathy because going back to what I pointed out earlier on, they really cannot comprehend that someone like me absolutely does not care and is a remorseless machine, and I am. And if those individuals were to meet me doing what I do professionally, they would have no doubt in a very short space of time that there is not a shred of emotional empathy flowing through these veins. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you what it is that I do. But if they were ever to witness it, they would soon realize. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, HG. I, I just have two questions left. I'll be very brief. Um, Quite all right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you've been speaking out about narcissism for some time now. Uh, yes. I'd love to know, uh, is there a question that hasn't been asked of you about it that you wish someone would ask? Off the top of my head, I can't think about one. I can't think precisely uh, of one that I'd want people to ask me. I suppose if you left that with me, I could come back to you and say, these are the questions that I'd like you to ask me. Mm. Um, uh, invariably, I get asked a lot of the, a lot of the similar ones. Um, <clears throat> but no, there isn't one that immediately springs to mind. Right. No, I, I understand that. I, I tried my best to, to switch it up and, and try and keep it fresh for you, but we'll undoubtedly do among, you know, some of the similar oh, subject the, matters. It is entirely the case that certain similar areas get, uh, get covered. Indeed. Um, and then there are people that go in from a, like yesterday, I spoke to a, a young lady. She was asking me more about the process of the way uh, of how I write because she's a writer. So that was quite interesting. Hmm. Um, so it was still about narcissism, but it was uh, the, the process that I've gone through to create the range of products that I have in the writing. So that was a, a, a different different angle. Everybody comes at it. Some some people want to talk about you know narcissism, the terminology they use. Some people want to know more about me and my views about certain things. Uh, some people want to know more about the history of me. So there's a, there's a wealth of uh, different angles that can be utilized. Right, right. You, you'll notice I, I took the terminological approach because sure. words words fascinate me. Um, mm -hmm. And people's misuse of words also fascinates me. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, was, I was pleased that you touched on the issue of people misusing the term narcissist and gaslighting, etc. Because they are particular bugbears of mine. Indeed. No, thank you, HD. I, uh, you know... In closing our time together, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to, to say this, but you know, there's 
much joy to be had in uh, a life derived from living for others and living in service to others, um, loving them for the sake of loving them with no transactional motive. And I, I don't know quite how I can say this, and I, I suspect there's no way I can say it where it can, can land, but I tell you, I really wish that you could feel it and feel the upper slopes of joy that are available to you when you do live for something greater than yourself. I don't, but I appreciate the sentiment in what you've said. Mm. I function highly effectively as I am, and I see that although people might explain that they have these rapturous moments of joy, I also see them curled up in the fetal position crying their eyes out. I also see them struggling with what the world throws at them, mired in their preoccupation with the past, being stuck in those little loops that human beings keep creating, doing the same things over and over and over again. Mm. Now, that is your perspective and you're perfectly entitled to it. And it may well be the case that that's entirely apt for you, but it isn't for me. I appreciate the sentiment of what you're saying. uh, The the short answer is thank you, but no thank you. Fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> nope, I'm, I will. I will happily take that. Uh, it probably won't surprise you that that answer isn't much of a surprise to me. <laughs> um, indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, HG Tutor, last time, how can people find out about you, sir? I have a range of platforms, so you can read material all gratis. Thousands of articles on my blog, Narc Site N A R C S I T E dot com. I have a thriving YouTube channel with thousands of videos, which is HG Tudor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra. Uh, You'll find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where the uh, materials are also available in terms of videos and articles. There is the Knowledge Vault, which has over 200 products in to help you understand more about narcissism and determine, are you dealing with the narcissist? Enable you to speak to me, find practical ways of co-parenting with narcissists, handling them at work, etc., so those are the various platforms that I have and that you can join millions of people who've read my books, which are dotted around on Amazon and also in the Knowledge Vault, and join all of those people that have accessed my material and have done the consultations and learn more about narcissism and solve the problems and achieve the freedom that you richly deserve. And I'd invite people to access that material and fill their boots. Excellent, excellent. HG Tudor, this was... Such a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this conversation for the last couple of weeks since you and I first uh, connected. So I'm grateful Good. to you for taking the time for me. Absolutely. Well, I think Pat, on the next occasion is that you, uh, I furnish you with a list of the questions that I want people to ask me. And then you can uh, have a look at that and then ask them of me and we can speak again. You know what? I would like that. Maybe someday I'll become Good. a secondary source for you. <laughs> You, you you can have that aspiration. It is a noble one, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, HG Tudor, what a pleasure it was. Thank you so much, and we'll be in touch, okay? You're, you're very welcome. Take care.